Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our Processing in Memory course. Today, we have Geraldo um, talking about um, Sindiram, which is a, a framework for bit serial CD processing using DRAM. Uh, we have talked in this war in this course about different approaches to processing in memory and remember that we mentioned from the beginning that there are the two main approaches one is near memory processing or processing near memory examples of that uh, we have covered in the course with uh, abmem uh, fim dram aim architectures uh, in terms of the, the other approach is uh, processing using memory and we haven't talk so much about that because there are no real products as far as we know that use uh, processing using memory. Remember that our previous lecture by Ataberg was um, a, a, a framework and end-to-end -end system to uh, play to, the, to, to implement and, and, and play around with uh, some processing using memory techniques, but there are many more things to, to do in that sense in order to enable general purpose processing high performance and, um, and high energy efficiency. So uh, one of these proposals is in DRAM and uh, Geraldo is the lead project, the, lead, the leader of this project. Um, so I think that he can give us a very good overview of this work. Thank you very much, Geraldo. Uh, so feel free to uh, start whenever you're ready. And um, everyone attending in, in uh, YouTube, also feel free to ask any questions in the YouTube chat. Thanks a lot, Juan. So I guess I'm not going to spend a lot of time in these slides since I did the excellent introduction already. So this work uh, we did it together um, and was submitted and accepted to ASPO 2021. And it's quite an exciting uh, research area for, for my PhD. And, and it's, which is pretty much enabling the use of processing using memory uh, in a system level perspective. So this is one of those uh, it's a framework to do that because as I'm going to sh show, uh, next you're going to build on top of a prior work from our group, uh, our group also called Ambit that enables so, some simple book bitwise Boolean operations in DRAM. So you're going to extend that. But without further ado, I'm going to start the talk. So again, I'm, I'm Geraldo. And today I'm going to talk about SIM DRAM, a framework for bit serial SIM processing using DRAM. So before we start, I'm going to talk. About, I'm going to give a brief executive summary of what this talk is about. So um, as I just mentioned, um, there are prior works that shows that we can uh, do some simple book bitwise operations using uh, the principles of DRAM operations uh, without any addition of, on, on logic, uh, which is quite good for throughput and uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, however, since th those approaches suffer from some problems because even though they have those prior works have shown how to do it fundamentally using the, uh, the book bitwise operations using the principles of uh, DRAM uh, operation, they only support a limit uh, and fixed set of operations. Uh, so usually Boolean uh, and or not XOR operations, and they lack the flexibility to enable the user to implement uh, other operations, even though Boolean. Uh, Boolean logic with not is logic complete, and ideally you could implement uh, many different operations, as I'm going to show during this talk. Um, doing so for more complex operations require, um, uh, and without modifications to data layout, require non-trivial area cost to the DRAM array. And there are prior works that do that, that um, goes to extend uh, what has been proposed by, for example, Ambit, by including some peripheral logic inside the DRAM array uh, that uh, enables to do some complex operations like addition. Uh, however, the, the area for, for those circuit modifications are quite critical because the DRAM core design is quite uh, sensitive to, to modifications and, and changes to technology and to, to inside the DRAM core array. So the goal of this work is to propose a, a process using DRAM framework that can pretty much um, uh, mitigate those problems that I just mentioned. So uh, enable the user to implement uh, complex operations using DRAM and give the user the flexibility to implement any desired operation uh, uh, following the steps of our framework. At the same time, without modifying the DRAM array uh, further than prior works have done. Um, 
this is one 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 key let's say uh, design goal of our group so based on that uh, we propose oh, my computer froze a little bit sorry so based on that we propose simdrum which is an m2n processing using the ram framework that gives the user the programming interface the isa and the hardware support to enable efficient uh, complex operations using DRAM and using a uh, massive parallel in the uh, substrate in the DRAM array itself. Uh, we extensively evaluate SimDRAM and we saw that it provides uh, 88 times and 5.8 times the throughput and 257 times and 31 times the energy efficiency of a baseline CPU and a high end CPU for 16 different DRAM operations that implement using this framework. And also we use SimDuram uh, framework to accelerate seven real world applications from uh, neural networks to, to databases, for example. And we see that SimDuram can provide 21 times and 2.1 uh, times the performance of the CPU and the GPU over those uh, seven real world applications. So here's the outline for this talk. So first I'm going to give a brief overview of processing using DRAM. And then I'm going to give the background uh, required to understand uh, what we are doing, the basic operations that we are going to build, build on top on. Then I'm going to uh, explain the SimDuram framework, gonna talk about this uh, briefly about the system integration that's proposed in the paper, evaluate, uh, provide some evaluation results, and then conclude. So first, start doing processes using DRAM. So uh, it's been a while since we've been, uh, we have started this processing memory class. So I think everyone probably is more or less uh, uh, aware that data movement is a key bottleneck in today's systems because of the data needs to move from, uh, from memory to the CPU in a von Neumann type of architecture. And the, the, the memory channel uh, that connects computing units to main memory is quite power hungry and a source of performance bottleneck as well. And as prior works have shown, more than 6% of the total energy in a system uh, can, for some particular set of applications, they spend on, on this data movement between CPU and in memory. So again, this is probably old news. Processing memory is a, is a paradigm that is not new. It was proposed many decades ago. ago. Uh, and the main goal is to move computation nearby the memory, aiming to mitigate this, uh, reduce this, this, this distance between memory and computation, and then uh, remove this data movement bottleneck and, and improve energy efficiency because you don't go to the memory channel anymore. So uh, as one mentioned in the beginning of the class, they are, uh, we are um, breaking down the, the, the types of processing memory architectures uh, into two groups, what we call processing near memory, uh, which are uh, the ones that we place computation near, we place some logic near the memory device themselves, but we still have some concepts of uh, logic being separated from, from the memory itself, right? It's just nearby, it's just closer than the regular CPU in the process center uh, implementation. Uh, however, uh, there is this other concept that is called processing using memory that now is more radical in the sense that we are going to leverage the way that the memory cells operates in the, in the, in the memory device to perform computation. So we are not including any type of logic to enable computation in processing using memory paradigm. You're going to use only the memory cells. And this is really good because it enables us to leverage the large internal bandwidth for memory devices and the parallelism available inside the memory devices to do computation. And there are prior works uh, in the literature, one of them from our um, group, Ambit, uh, from Micro 2017, that uh, shows that um, it's possible to use DRAM cells to implement simple logic operations like AND, OR, or XOR. And prior works, follow-up follow work shows that we can do some more complex operations um, building on top of that, like addition and multiplications. So this is just the issue of the context that we are going to be working on on this talk. So now I'm going to give a brief overview of how DRAM operates and how the process, prior works on processing using DRAM leverage the DRAM operation to perform computation so we can move forward and understand conceptually what is happening. Okay, so this is again, shouldn't be so new for you. So we have here a DRAM model, which is composed of memory, uh, many DRAM chips 
and each DRAM chip is composed of multiple DRAM banks, and multiple DRAM banks have many uh, subarrays, which are 2D arrays of, of, of DRAM cells. And, and this 2D array of DRAM cells are horizontally connected using word lines, they're vertically connected uh, using uh, bit lines. And the bit lines are further connected to our array of sense amplifiers, which is called a row buffer. A DRAM cell itself is composed of uh, a storage capacitor, which is stored data uh, in DRAM as charge, and an access transistor, which enables and disables the charge flow from the storage capacitor to the, to the bit line and then to the sense amplifier and row buffer. So the DRAM cell operates using three main uh, comments. So those are activate or act, uh, read and write, or and precharge. And I'm going to briefly talk about them. So uh, to read the charge levels stored in the DRAM capacitor, in the storage capacitor, the memory controller first issues uh, what we call activate comment. So prior to receiving the activate comment, the bit lines uh, in the in the in the subarray are going to be held on the reference voltage, which is usually half of VDD. So when the, the DRAM array receives the activate comment, uh, the word line of the target row is going to be asserted, which is going to connect the storage capacitor um, to the respective uh, bit line. Then the storage, cap uh, the storage capacitor is going to share ch charge uh, with uh, the bit line. And then the simplifier is going to be enabled. When the simplifier is enabled, it's going to sense uh, uh, a distribution in, in voltage in the bit line, and it's going to amplify this 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 uh, this, this deviation in the voltage of the bit line. Um, so once the the amplification is finished by the simplifier, the charge the, the charge is restored into the store capacitor, and the amplification process is finished. And then after that, the data is going to be latched inside the simplifier and the row buffer. And then the memory controller can issue read and write requests to, to read columns of the data from this simplifier. After the DRAM finishes reading the data, it needs to issue a precharge command that is pretty much going to prepare the DRAM array to, to receive follow up activation comments to another rows. So in this process, um, the, the capacitor. In, um, is first the storage capacitor is first disconnected from the from the bit line by lowering the word line, um, and then the bit slide voltage is, is restored to the reference half of the uh, voltage. And after this point, the DRAM is is ready to be accessed to an, uh, to receive access to another row. And then finally, the the simplifier is disabled. So. There are prior works in the literature um, that shows that we can manipulate how the RAM operates using this activate and precharge command to do uh, what um, what we call in DRAM operations. So one of those first works are with, uh, is is row clone, and which enables us to do in DRAM row copy operations. So let's see how you want to, how does how this row copy operation uh, works. So let's, let's assume that you want to copy the values in source row, uh, row A to the destination row B. And those two rows are going to share the same bit line. So row clone is going to enable copying source, uh, source row A into destination row B uh, in the same subarray sub by issuing two consecutive activate comments uh, to these two rows, followed by a precharge comment. And recall this sequence of comments uh, activate, activate, precharge uh, comment. And it works as follows. So um, first we should activate comments to source row A, which is going to copy the contact from the, from the, from the source row, uh, row A into the row buffer. We then issue activate comment to the destination row B, which is going to connect the cell in the destination row, in the destination row B to the bit line. So because this amplifier has already sensed an amplifier, the source of the, the, the source data in A, by the time that row B is going to be activated, the data in each cell of row B is overwritten by the data storing the row buffer, which is then pretty much copying the data from the source row A to the destination row B. And, and this implements the row copy operation. So after the row copy operation is done, we just issue a precharge comment again to allow DRAM to, to, to allow DRAM to receive new 
uh, comments in the same subarray. So uh, I, uh, for following similar properties, uh, prior works have shown that we could do uh, majority functions in Durham. So uh, for you to, just for you to have some background, uh, three input majority operation is going to output one uh, if and only if two of the inputs are also one. So let's assume that you want to do this majority operation between three Durham rows, Durham rows A, B, and C. All the rows again share the same bit line. So the authors of Ambit and shows that we can see by simultaneously activating the three Durham, row, Durham rows at the same time via a Durham operation that we are going to call triple row activation can be used to perform Boolean majority operations on the values stored in those three, uh, in the cells of these three rows. So let's see how it works. So first we are going to activate all the three rows uh, at the same time. So here we're activating A, B, and C using the triple row activation command. So this is going to connect all of the three uh, Durham cells into the shared bit line, which then is going to, um, uh, what is going to happen is going to sh share, is going to simultaneously flow from those three Durham cells into the bit line to the sense amplifier and then perturbate the sense amplifier. Uh, when the sense amplifier sends this perturbation, the sense amplifier is, go um, is going to uh, um, amplify the bit line voltage to either VDD or zero if at least two of the store, the, the capacitor of the three uh, Durham cells are charged or discharged respectively. As such, uh, triple row activation result is, in the, is a Boolean majority operation among all of those three Durham cells. Um, this example that we have here, the majority of the, the rows A, B, and C is going to be equal to VDD because the first row, uh, uh, the first Durham cell A is, uh, is, in, is in a char charged state uh, B is also in a charged state and C is in a discharged state. So when the, all those three rows are going to be activated at the same time, the, the sense amplifier is going to put the voltage to the majority of the three. And in the end of the operation, the memory control, uh, the end of the operation, the, the date, the resulting of the operation that is stored in the sense amplifier is going, to be, is going to be written to all of those three Durham cells at the same time, A, B, A, C, and D, which basically is destroying the original data that was stored in, this, uh, in these Durham cells. Again, in the end of the operation, we issue a pre-charge comments to prepare Durham to uh, new comments. So Ambit is going to use this triple row activation process uh, that is doing the majority operation to implement Boolean majority and the NOR, Boolean or and the NOR operations um, by setting one of the input rows, uh, for example, C to either one or, or zero, because our uh, end operation is computed by setting, uh, is, is, the end operation is pretty much as the majority of A, B, and zero, and the OR operation is pretty much equivalent to the majority of A, B, and one. So in order to perform pro, uh, processing using Duram, Ambit makes some modifications to the Duram array uh, so we can efficiently do computation, uh, the, uh, perform this triple row activation uh, in VRAM. And those modifications prior work later showed that was actually not required in the sense that there are, there are prior work in the literature that shows that uh, that takes out of the shelf VRAM and by doing some time violations and issuing consecutive activation to the DRAM, they observe that indeed you can do triple row activation in majority operations. Uh, so what on the, the, the separate organization that Ambit is going to use is, is more to efficiently enable this triple row activation rather than uh, a needs to enable, to, uh, a must to enable triple row activation. So let's see how it works. So Ambit is going to split the, the, this, the, this, the rows in the DRAM subarrays uh, into in the they, they can enable they are enabled to do computation in three different groups. So the first group uh, is what we call the bitwise group. Those are sixteen uh, 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 rows that are designed to do triple row activations. Then you are going to have two rows that are the going to store constant values for us to do and and or, and they are going to be pre-initialized with either one or zero. Then we have the rest of the remaining of the rows that store uh, user or program data. So Ambit is going to use some special row decoders so we can enable triple row activation 
uh, with a single uh, address uh, uh, issued to DRAM. So first we have the regular row decoder, right? That we can uh, send a comment and then uh, address, and then it's going to ask, uh, uh, pull up one of the word lines. And then we have this uh, special um, row decoder, which uh, uh, can activate three DRAM rows with a single address, uh, which and then perform the triple row activation uh, efficiently. So this modification into the that Ambit proposes into the DRAM array incurs less than one percent of area overhead on top of uh, exist, existing DRAM chips. So as I as I, I was saying, um, uh, there are many follow-ups that came after Ambit showing that uh, how to use this triple row activation comment to do, uh, to implement end in our operations in order. Uh, memory technology. Sometimes it's not even triple row activation, they operate some different principles, but showing that uh, other, there are, uh, other memory technologies can also perform uh, book bitwise uh, Boolean operations like uh, NVMs, for example, RAM or PCM memories. However, all of them share a similar shortcut. Uh, the first one is that they only support simple uh, basic operations like ba uh, Boolean operations, NDNOR, XOR or simple addition operations, which is not applicable to, is not wide applicable to a broader range of applications. There are applications that do leverage um, Boolean operations a lot, but it's not a, it's a limit set. Uh, also, they support a limit set of operations. So uh, there is no flexibility to enable further operations on top of whatever has been proposed. And uh, the ones that do go a step further and propose some more complex operations in core, Pretty uh, a significant change to the DRAM array, which is quite costly in terms of error and power. So this leads us to the problem that we need a framework that need that can aid the adoption of processing using memory by enabling the 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 program or the user to efficiently implement complex operations using DRAM and also provide them to the flexibility to increase to create new uh, in DRAM operations as needed. So therefore, the goal of, of this work is definitely to, to solve this problem or to meet to to, solve, to fix those problems for prior works in the literature, and then proposing this processing memory framework that can efficiently implement complex operations in DRAM, give the user the flexibility to implement new operations, and at the same time without changing the DRAM uh, array organization. And based on that, we propose in DRAM, which I'm going to uh, describe next. So uh, the key, so the SimDRAM, as I just said, is this end-to-end -end processing using DRAM framework that provides the program interface, the ISA and the hardware support to efficiently compute, uh, computing complex operations in DRAM, giving the user the ability to implement arbitrary operations as required and using DRAM as a massive SIMD substrate uh, without changing the DRAM array. So um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to next describe what is the substrate that the processing using DRAM substrate that SimDRAM builds on top on? So uh, this substrate uh, that SimDRAM builds on top of requires two uh, previous proposed techniques. So the first one is vertical data layout. And what we are going to do here, so instead of store, storing data in the traditional horizontal data layout, uh, so we have a data word and which is placed in a DRAM row. All of the bits are placed in the same DRAM row. We are going to transpose that and place different uh, uh, bits of a DRAM of a data word across different uh, word lines. And why you're going to do that? Because prior works have shown by doing so, we can um, we 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 can do bit shifting quite efficiently without. Uh, without the need of adding extra logic to shift elements uh, across bit lines. So as I said, the first benefit of this is the, this implicit bit shift operation. And also now we can see each bit line as an individual SIMD lane or an individual single structure multiple data um, engine that we can leverage to do computation. At the same time, what we are, the other technique we are going to use is the majority-based computing. Um, so prior work, as Ambit has uh, shown, right, was pretty much doing computation on uh, and and or and not operation, which is the regular Boolean algebra that most of us are familiar with. Uh, however, 
since the sense amplifier already implements a uh, uh, majority operation uh, naturally, naturally uh, we can uh, take use of another type of, of, of algebra that is the majority base algebra. And this is going to enable us uh, to provide higher performance than, than, than convert everything to end or, or, or not operation. And also at the same time, having higher throughput because we very much require less numbers or less number of triple row activation to do the same computation than end in or or and not operations. So next I'm going to describe the uh, Simdurum uh, framework. So the Simdurum framework is, uh, has three main steps. So uh, it takes as input uh, a, a user uh, defined uh, operation in the form of and and or, and or not logic. So this can be some uh, very log codes in some GitLab implementation of and and or or not, or some truth table or something, or any represent or anything that gives a and and or not representation of an operation. So then the first step of this simdrum operation is to, to convert this and and or not logic into majority logic uh, so we can optimize the number of triple activations that we are going to need to execute in duram to do the desired computation then after that the second step the second step we are going to generate the uh, the the required uh, sequence of duram activate and precharge comments that implements that that uh, that majority graph that we got from the previous step in step one uh, uh, implement them in the, the drum substrate that we are using that is pretty much what we, uh, we borrow for ambit. And we call the sequence of operations a micro program. So at the end of step two, what we are going to have is a new Simdurum micro program, which is stored in main memory, uh, and also a new Simdurum instruction that is added to this, this CPU YSA. This, this new Simdurum instruction allows the user to interface to this new generated Simdurum in Durham operation from the from source code. So then uh, the, the it's important to say that step one and two are happening offline, right? Uh, bef before the execution of the pro program. So then during the execution of the program, the user mode finds the application to include this new uh, oper uh, Simdurum operation here uh, called BibOp uh, new. And then, and then during the execution of the operation, we include the control unit inside the memory controller that is responsible to loading this, uh, this the, the, the micro program that corresponds to this new Simdurum instruction from a memory or for a buffer that we store in the control unit, and then coordinate the execution of this of the required sequence of activating precharge commands to implement the required operations transparently from the from the user. And then in the end, we are going to have the, the, the output of the, the, the required BBOP operations or the Simdurum instruction in, uh, inside uh, Duram. So next I'm going to describe each one of those steps in some level of detail, starting by step one. So uh, as, as I, I showed before, and as, as Ambit has also shown, it's quite trivial to convert a Boolean equation to its equivalent majority equation. So uh, as, um, as for example, uh, end operation can be implemented uh, using a three input majority primitive where by setting one of the, one of the inputs to zero and the same for our operation that can be implemented by setting one of the inputs to, to one. So if you have a end or not basic implementation of of uh, of our operation. So here, for example, we have the, the the implementation of a full adder or or a one bit adder, right? Because yeah, just one bit. But yeah, so this is the representation of the adder, right? You can see in the top, uh, like the generation. This is actually just the C out part of the adder. So the the care propagation. So if you want to just replay, if you want to just convert this graph into the majority representation, we can use just use the quality that I just showed on the top and replace each one of those and the R gates into majority gates. However, naively convert this uh, uh, and or not implementation of our circuit into the majority not implementation of our circuit, a circuit is going to lead to an unoptimized circuit as I'm going to show next. 
So to address this issue, the, 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 we are going to perform some uh, majority not optimizations. So uh, to do that, we are going to take the inefficiently major majority not based implementation of the of the in or not um, or in or not uh, uh, circuit, and then you are going to 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 give a pass uh, in this, this, this circuit using a grid optimization algorithm proposed by PrioWorks, which pretty much optimize. Uh, this circuit in a similar way that we are used to optimize Boolean uh, logic, right? Using some uh, Boolean uh, optimization rules like the Morgan or reduction. So there is a set of logic operations or optimization operations also for majority-based logic proposed by this prior works. And then we are pretty much applying this, this set of transformations into in this great uh, optimization algorithms to further optimize and reduce the number of majority gates into in our circuits. So here, for example, uh, in this case, we can see that uh, both, both graphs here are equivalent and uh, we further optimize this four gate graph that generates the C out into uh, one single gate uh, graph that generates the C out. So uh, it, it, if you think about latency, it has the, the potential of reducing the latency of the the initial latency of the operation by one fourth, right? Because we are uh, reducing the number of majority gates required to do the computation. So in summary, uh, the, the main goal of step one is to gen of our syndrome framework to generate uh, optimized majority not implementation of the desired operation using this grid optimization algorithm. So let's now take a look into step two of the syndrome framework. So, uh, each signature of operation is going to be stored, as I said previously, in, in what we call a microprogram, which is a series of microarchitecture operations, such activate and precharge comments, that SimDRAM is going to use to uh, implement the operation in DRAM. In this way, the goal of the second step is to take the optimized majority not based implementation generated in the first step and generate a microprogram that executes the desired operation in DRAM. To this end, this, the, the second step has two main tasks that it needs to execute. So the first task, task is what we call alloc uh, allocating DRAM rows to operands, which is going to assign each input operand into the majority operation to a DRAM row. And the second step is to generate the microprogram, uh, optimized microprogram that implements the desired operation in DRAM. So let's take a look in step two uh, first. So the goal of the first step, the first task is to allocate DRAM rows to input operands of each majority primitive into the majority not based implementation of the operation and in DRAM. So when we're allocating DRAM rows to operands, in DRAM needs to take into account two extra constraints that are particular from processing using DRAM. So the first one is that the number of compute rows that we have available in the, bit, uh, in the bitwise group that I presented previously in the subarray is quite limited, right? We only had um, some few rows over there because of that special row decoder that we implemented. Um, the second one is that when you perform the majority operation in DRAM, uh, we are pretty much overwriting the initial data uh, uh, to the result of the majority uh, operation, right? Which can be a problem if you need to reuse that input data again. So based on these two issues, we present a new allocation algorithm that is pretty much inspired by uh, traditional linear scan register allocation algorithms that compiler is used. So our allocation algorithm takes as inputs the majority not implementation of the operation generated in step one, and it starts by assigning each input of each majority logic to the available compute rows one at a time. Since the number of, uh, of compute rows are quite limited there, so here in this example, only have three, this step of the algorithm is going to assign only as many inputs to the compute rows as the number of compute rows that are not allocated yet to our operand. So next, performing a triple row activation uh, in the compute rows comp uh, is going to, at the same time, compute the majority of the, of the assigned rows, so A, B, C, and C, and carrying here in the in this example and in and then generating the carry out value for for the for the full header example that we were describing before 
So as a result of the restrictive behavior of the triple row activation, the carry out is going to be stored in the three inputs that was used as for the triple row activation uh, after the, 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 the majority operation is executed. So our allocation algorithm is going to take advantage of this behavior and reuse these rows for no uh, for uh, next uh, row to operate the allocation uh, in the next round of triple row activations. In case any one of the following majority operations uses as input uh, any one of the uh, the of, of the previous assigned uh, rows. So next, we are going to take a look into step two of our uh, task two. Sorry, of step two of of Simdira. So uh, task two, uh, it, it is broke down to three steps. So let's just recall what task one did, right? So task one generated, assigned uh, a majority gate. Initially, we have a majority gate that represents a comp operation. Then we assign to each one of the inputs and outputs of the majority gate. We assign DRAM rows and triple row activations uh, to, uh, sorry, we assign uh, DRAM rows a similar way that you assign registers uh, to, to instructions in a, in a regular uh, CPU-based code. So now we are going to generate the microprogram, right? So first we're going to generate the initial microprogram by following the assigned uh, DRAM to rows um, uh, DRAM to rows uh, location that was generated by task one. And then we are going to use broke copy operations, which constitute of two activations and follow up by a precharge operation to copy the initial data to, uh, from data rows to the bitwise group and then uh, followed by a majority operation uh, to execute the triple row activation in the bitwise group, right? Um, and then in the, in the end of the, the of the, or the execution of the instruction, we generate the, we copy back the output that is in the bitwise group to the data grow, the data rows using uh, uh, again, uh, activate pre-charge sequence of comments. So the, the resulting of this assignment of this initial assignment of the operation to sequence of activation pre-charge comments is what we are going to call an initial microprogram. So this initial microprogram does implement the, the required operations in DRAM correctly, but it can be further optimized to reduce the, the, the latency of the operation. So we apply two op optimizations. So the first optimization here is by coalescing row copies uh, into a single, uh, several row copies into a single one. And the second one is to merge majority and row copy operations uh, that, uh, that targets the same row into a single activate and activate pre-charge uh, comment sequence. So uh, with these two optimi optimizations, uh, task two of step two uh, generates the optimized uh, microprogram that requires few DRAM operations to execute the same desired operation. So we invite you to check our paper for more uh, details on, on the description of our algorithms that assign uh, rows to the input of the majority case to the RAM rows and also details of the optimization that we apply over here. So finally, so uh, the last part of task two is to generate uh, an n-bit implementation of the desired operation, right? So, so far before that, we only had a one bit uh, output uh, for this bit for this uh, micro program. So basically, we need to insert some control registers of control instructions to uh, allow this uh, this sequence of triple row activations to loop for as many bits or data elements you have in the data world as needed. So in this way, we execute the operation in a bit serial uh, manner inside DRAM. And then in the end, we are going to have the final microprogram, uh, which is an optimized uh, implementation of the initial and then or not based implementation that was inputted by the user. And, and it can be repeated any times to generate a, a bit serial implementation of the operation uh, in Durham. So the, my, the final microprogram that is generated is stored in a reserved DRAM space for future use. And as I said, also is going to create, is going to produce a syndrome instruction called baby op 
which is then added to the CPU ISA and the user can leverage to, to instantiate, let's say, this, uh, this uh, generated microprogram. So let's take now a look into step three of the framework, uh, which finally is going to execute the computation of the injury operation. So Simgram uses a control unit in the memory controller that handles the execution of the microprogram during the execution time transparently from the programmer. To perform a Simgram uh, uh, operation, the, prog uh, the program is going to leverage this BBOP instruction. Upon receiving this BBOP instruction, the control unit loads the microprogram corresponding to the BBOP instruction into the, uh, from the main memory and performs the requested sequence of activate pre-charge that was generated by test two of step two of the, of the framework. Um, and then, uh, and then executing the required in general computation. In the end, the microprogram at the end of the microprogram execution, the outcome of the SimDuram operation is then stored in Duram. Uh, in your paper, there is a more description of the control unit that we have, uh, but it's quite uh, uh, laborish to go to all of the small details. But we invite you to check out our paper. You have uh, any doubts about uh, about it? But you can think about it as a simple, uh, a simple um, uh, in order pr uh, processor. So now you're going to discuss the SIM, uh, how we integrate SIMDRAM into the system. Uh, sorry, Juan, I have a question. Maybe not. Uh, no, uh, I don't think there are any specific questions right now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. It's because your 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 Zoom thing went green. I thought it was a question. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. So as I was talking about, now you're going to talk about how to integrate SimDuram uh, into the equation, in the test system. So there are many, many challenges of implementing process using Duram uh, into a system. Uh, so that is the ones that SimDuram imposes as for example, we call that um, we transpose the data, right? So you, instead of having data in a horizontal data layout, you have data now in a, in a vertical data layout. So we need to efficiently transpose data uh, from one layout to another. So uh, this is one challenge, but there are more challenges related to the to the paradigm itself. So how you do, how you interface to processing using memory structures or processing using DRAM instructions. So we provide some program interface. How we can handle page faults, edit translation, coherence, and interrupts. How we handle the fact that there is a limit uh, subarray size uh, in DRAM arrays. Uh, also the security implications of of doing processing using DRAM. And finally, in the paper, we talk about the limitations of a framework. So here in this talk, I'm going to talk about two of those system integration challenges. So the first one being how can we efficiently transpose data in Duram. So as I said, Duram operates in a vertical layout data, but we want to maintain the horizontal data layouts uh, the version of the of the data that the system has because horizontal data layout has these advantages, right? From this is, that is a reason why the system uses improved throughput, locality, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we want to, that both layouts to coexist in the system at the same time. So how can you do it? Uh, so the main challenge is that we, the data can be shared. Uh, a piece, any piece of data can be shared between the SimDuram or, uh, engine and the CPU, but SimDuram is going to use data in the vertical data layout and the CPU is going to use data in the horizontal data layout. So uh, to mitigate the, uh, the overhead of doing this, of this uh, transposing between one, one layout and the other, uh, SimDuram is going to use a specialized hardware unit that is placed between the last level cache and the memory controller called the data transposition unit. The data transposition unit transforms the data layout from the horizontal data layout to the vertical data layout and vice versa. So the transposition unit is going to track uh, SimDuram objects into this object tracker and ensures that this corresponding data is in a vertical data layout and ready for SimDuram computation whenever the data is in Duram or and in a horizontal data layout whenever the data is in the cache and is ready to be computed by the processor. So again, I invite, um, I invite check, you to check our paper for more details on the, the design of the transposing uh, transposition unit. Um, but we evaluate the area and the, 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 the area overheads of these units in the CPU die, and we see that is, uh, and also the throughput uh, um, impact that it has on some DRAM operations. And you see that it has 
this transposition uh, unit ha in, has really low impact on throughput of syndrome operations and really low area cost compared to this in, in the memory control. So it's like 0 0.06 millimeters squares is, is pretty, not that big a deal. So yeah, the, yes. A, a quick question about the transposition. How long can you keep your, uh, how long can you keep your data in the transpose form? So there is no time deadline uh, for the data to be uh, transposed, uh, to, to be stay in the transpose form. So um, what happens is when the, I'm going to show a piece of code next, and there are some special instructions that the programmer used to, to say that some piece of data is a syndrome object. And then whatever this, date, this, this memory address that corresponds to this piece of data passes through the is evicted from the level cache to to the RAM. The the transposition units automatically transpose this data to the horizontal uh, data layout and and to the to the vertical data layout. And whenever the transpose the CPU loads this piece of data back, the data is not in the cache. It needs to be loaded from a memory. The transposition unit is going to trans the data is going to pass to the vertical to horizontal transpose buffer and it's going to be converted back. So. It's kind of it's highly depends on uh, on the access pattern that the the application of the user uh, is going to issue, uh, but there is no time deadline for the data to be to be in either format. So the data can stay in the vertical data layout while uh, staying in, in memory and and being operated on in memory, uh, and only needs to be transposed when the CPU, the CPU needs to access the data. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So one other question that I have, would it be possible to, I don't know, propose uh, or design uh, different ways, other ways of transposing, for example, in the, in the DRAM itself or in, in the CPU and with some software library? Yeah, yeah, there are many alternatives. So, uh... There definitely with uh, from in software itself, we can transpose the data using uh, special libraries. So, for example, the UpMem system does some uh, software transposing. Uh, it's not exactly the same as Syndrum, I guess, but uh, there is some library to do some form of data transposition of layout or organization. Uh, but that can incur some quite significant. Uh, 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 performance overhead, depending on how much data you transpose and the amount of operation that you're going to do. Uh, in Durham itself, we do have some works from our own group, as for example, uh, Figaro, uh, that in the, that shows that we, uh, ways of 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 copying data from uh, columns of data from one row and separate to another one, which kind of enables some sort of transposing. Again, it's not exactly the same as in Durham, but it's some uh, uh, it, it is some form of, of data reorganization. And there are other works that, for example, the, uh, that does um, processing using cache as uh, dual cache or narrow cache that also requires to do that, that also requires a vertical data layout. And over there, they propose some special, there, there's some special SRAM circuit design that enables you to read data in either, either way, vertical or, 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 or or horizontal, and then so they use some special transpose box using these DRAM cells to do this this transposing operations. So this is a more like circuit level implementation of of that of the operation of the transposing operation. So yeah, there are many alternatives. The transposition unit that we propose here is one design. Um, sorry, probably there are other designs that are more efficiently efficient than this one. Um, but for this initial version of the Syndrome framework, we saw that this one was good enough for 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 initial realization of the system. Okay, thank you. Makes sense. Uh, thank okay. you, Geraldo. Okay, so this was about the, the trans transposing data, and then um, we see how we can the other system integration challenge that we mitigate is how it enabled the user to interface with Syndrome uh, from, the, from the programming perspective. So we, we had four new Syndrome ISA extensions 
uh, into the CPU ISA. And those, uh, those are, they, they all follow similar uh, uh, layouts. So first we have instructions, SIMDRAM instruction that executes initializations. So as I said before, right? So this, uh, when you are programming SIMDRAM, the user is required to specify which addresses or which uh, memory uh, areas are going to be SIMDRAM objects or going to be operated by SIMDRAM. And, and the user then uses this bbop transpose in its operation and pass the address of the, the that um, that memory space, the size, and the number of bits that it it, it corresponds to, to pretty much uh, signal to, uh, signal to the transposition unit that the that data needs to be transposed back and forth horizontally and vertical data layouts. Then you have proper SIGDRAM operations, and the SIGDRAM operations are just BBOP uh, BBOP op operations. This op can be addition. Uh, multiplications, or, uh, and then you have operation that has one input, uh, as for example, reductions and the NOR, XNOR reductions, have two input, uh, input operations, like, uh, like for example, ends, sorry, not ends, uh, adds or multiplication or division, and also have uh, predication operations, which has three inputs. So you can see this predication operation as a, some sort of if else or a MOOCs type of operation. And all of these, uh, all of these uh, instructions required for you to pass the number of data elements uh, which SIMDRAM is going to operate on, which is quite good because it gives a lot of flexibility, right? This end can be, uh, if you have, for example, a quantized quant neural network, it can be four bits, eight bits, or if you have uh, a long data format, it can be 64 bits, whatever. Uh, 128 bit if it's longer pack, but whatever is needed for the computation. So now I'm going to give a give a, a brief uh, overview of what does a SIMDRAM enabled code uh, looks like. So here uh, I have some simple C code. Uh, this is 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 a vector addition or sub, uh, subtraction based on some predicated uh, values. So here, as you can see, we allocate our arrays A, B, and C. This is a regular uh, C code. Then you have some uh, uh, some condition. So and then basically what we do is uh, you do a simple vector um, uh, vector uh, operation. You loop over all of the inputs, and if uh, if the condition is true, you do a vector addition. If the condition is false, you are going to do a vector subtraction. So you're, they're going to convert this code into SIMDRAM enabled code. So this is the equivalent SIMDRAM enabled code, and I'm going to highlight some important points next. So as I said before, the first step is to assign signal to SIMDRAM, uh, which input elements are going to uh, be used by SIMDRAM um, engine and like the, going to be executed in DRAM. So the transposing of the data can happen by the, uh, later on, right? So here pretty much we are marking that arrays A, B, and C are going to be SIMDRAM objects using the BBOP transposing it operation. So, sorry. Then uh, what we're going to do. So since SIMDRAM uh, is a SIMD operation, and also the control unit is, is responsible for the looping of the computation. We, are, we don't need this for, for construct anymore. But instead, we just create, uh, instantiate this op add operation here for the case of the add, passing the input uh, element, so uh, A and B. And the output here in this case is going to be some uh, intermediate data, D. The size of the, of the, of the data, uh, so the size of the arrays, and then the, the data width of the of the of the of the inputs of A and B. So here we are using uh, uh, unsigned eight integers. So this would be eight. So this is for the addition. So then for the subtraction, we do pretty much the same. A and B, the size of the of the array, the uh, eight for the bit width, and also the output is some uh, intermediate data. Then uh, we compute the predicate for the for the the condition. Sorry, so here in the case is a of i is, is larger than some 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 value. So we check you uh, do pretty much the same, right? A so we have a uh, the the pred here, the size of the data, the element size, and the the auxiliary uh, uh, row, 
And finally, we have the, uh, the predicate execution using the if else statement. So pretty much here, what, what we have is, uh, we have, uh, we pass the, the output, which is either C, right? And the output is going to be either D or E. Uh, so it's either the, the result of the addition of, or the subtraction, depending on the condition that is storing F. And again, we pass the size of the, the of the, all of the arrays and then the bit width. So basically uh, what we did was we removed the, the we, we removed the loop construct from, from, the, from the code. And then we, we explicitly uh, uh, issue SIMDRAM uh, operations and the no, uh, sub and great and if and else to the, to the code. So in the paper, we, we, we do all of these transformations from code from our real world uh, workloads manually, but we do discuss alternatives. So, uh, so this is not much different than programming, doing SIMD programming for AVX instructions, for example. So one way could be leverage those operations or doing some compiler transformations that we discuss in the paper, for example, right? or providing APIs that encapsulate more complex access patterns. So all of those are possible. So uh, we invite you to check our paper for further discussions on into the, the other system integration challenge that SimDRAM addressing, addresses. And if you have any questions about any of them, please feel free to send me an email, I'll be glad to take them. So finally, I'm going to pre present some evaluation results of SimDRAM. So we extensively evaluate SimDRAM. Uh, we did some simulations based on Gen5, and we consider three different baseline systems. So we have a multi-core CPU, uh, high-end GPU, and also Ambit, which, was the which is the state-of-the-art memory computing mechanism, but uses Boolean operation instead of majority-based uh, operations to do computation. We evaluate three different SimDRAM configurations, all of them using a DDR4 device. Uh, the first one is the baseline SIMDRAM, which uh, we, we enable one DRAM bank to do SIMDRAM computations. This is going to enable us to have us, uh, uh, a width of SIMD lanes of 8 kilo, uh, by, uh, uh, 65,000 uh, SIMD lanes, which is the same size of the, SIMD, of the DRAM row buffer, uh, which is scaled with the number of banks that we enable. So if you have four banks, this goes, uh, this, this number of SIMD lanes is, is, is is multiplied by four and 60 banks is multiplied by six, uh, 16. So uh, we also evaluate, we use the SimDRAM framework to implement 16 complex SimDRAM operations as for example, absolute values, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, equality checks, bit count, uh, real operations used by neural networks, uh, predication and, and the NOR and XOR reduction. And then we use, we also leverage these complex operations uh, and we implement seven real world applications from different domains on so database, uh, machine learning, neural networks and graphics uh, to show SimDRAM benefits in, uh, in real world applications. So I'm going to provide a brief summary of all of these evaluations. The evaluation section of our paper is quite extensive. And so again, I invite you to check our paper to, to more details of anything that I'm going to talk next. So the first thing that we evaluate is the throughput of the SimDRAM instructions compared to the CPU, uh, GPU, and Ambit uh, baselines. So here we have the x-axis, all of those baselines, and the y-axis, the average normalized throughput in gig operations per second. So we see that SimDRAM one bank provides 1.5, 5.5 times, 22 times, and 88 times the number of, of, of uh, the, the average throughput to call all of those 16 different operations compared to the CPU. Uh, for SimDRAM one bank, four banks and 16 banks. Compared to the GPU, SimDRAM with a single bank is not enough to outperform the GPU. It provides uh, uh, 0 0.5 times the throughput of the GPU. However, with, six, with uh, four, four SimDRAM enabled banks, you can already outperform the GPU by 1.5 times. And, up, and with 16 banks, this goes to 5.8 times, sorry. Similarly, uh, here the Ambit implementation is also using a single bank. So the first thing would be compared to SimDRAM one bank with Ambit one bank uh, and one enabled bank. And we see that SimDRAM outperform Ambit by two times in that case. But for the increasing SimDRAM, uh, the number of SimDRAM enabled banks compared to Ambit enables to outperform Ambit by 7.9 times or 31.6 times. 
So uh, the conclusion is that Singram uh, significantly outperformed all of the state or state of the art baselines, including CPU and GPU, for a wide range of uh, operations. We also evaluate the energy efficiency of Singram across of the 16 Singram operations. So here I have a similar plot. In the x-axis we have CPU, the baseline CPU, GPU, and embeds. In the y-axis I have the average energy efficiency in giga operations or, or performance per watt, basically. Um, uh, and then what we see is that the Singram uh, operations uh, provide more energy efficiency than the CPU by 257 times, the GPU by 31 times, and by Mbit by 2.6 times. And again, uh, the conclusion is that Singram is more energy efficient than all of the previous uh, state-of-the-art uh, baseline for a wide range of operations. And finally, we have the analysis of the seven ruled applications, uh, which again, we are summarizing those plots here. And we see that Simduram outperformed the CPU uh, average, across, uh, average across all of the seven applications by three times, 8.7 times, and 20, 20, 21 times when you increase the number of Simduram enabled bank. Uh, again, Simduram with a single enabled bank is not enough to outperform the GPU, uh, neither for uh for four banks in the paper we discussed why this is happening uh some applications uh do for example multiplications uh which is an uh, implementation of multiplication in Simdram is not uh that efficient compared for example to implementation of, of addition uh, and the, the gpu is extremely good in doing multiplications for example so this is the the reason why however with 16 uh duran banks in um, sorry Simdram can outperform the GPU average across of the uh, benchmarks that we uh, have. Uh, again, Simduram outperformed Embits by 2.5 times with a single bank, 7.3 times with four banks, and 17.5 times with uh, 16 banks. So we conclude that Simduram is quite a, a efficiently and effective accelerator for many commonly used real-world applications across different domains. As I said, there are many more uh, things in the paper. So we evaluate the reliability of twin paper activations in DRAM, the overhead of moving data within and across uh, subarrays, the overhead of data transposition, the area overhead of our, uh, of our uh, SimDRAM control units, and also we compare SimDRAM with the previous proposed in-cache computing accelerator. So all of that, we invite you to check our paper for more explanations on that. So before I'm going to conclude, I'm going to ask Juan if there is any question on the chat. Otherwise, um, we can conclude. No, I don't think that there are any other questions right now. Okay. Okay, so let, let me conclude. So in this paper uh, or in this talk, we introduce in more details the processing using memory uh, paradigm in processing memory, which are is 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 instead of including some logic devices into the DRAM array, uh, we are leveraging the DRAM cells in the operation principles of DRAM cells to execute computation in a more, let's say, fundamental way, because um, again, there is no logic included being, uh, being included here doing the computation. And we build on top of prior works and this idea of processing using memory to enable complex operations and uh, flexibility um, of enable new operations as required uh, in our end-to-end -end processing using DRAM framework. So SimDRAM also, again, provides the program interface, the ISA and the hardware support to do efficiently operations or efficiently co uh, complex operations in DRAM, uh, giving the flexibility of new operations in DRAM and using DRAM as a massively parallel SIMD substrate. Uh, uh, we sensibly evaluate SimDRAM and we see that it extensively outperformed a CPU, a GPU, and Ambit for 16 Indram operations. And Syndrome can also uh, uh, accelerate real-world applications compared to the CPU and GPU baselines. So we hope and we believe that Syndrome is a promising uh, processing framework that can ease the adoption of processing Syndrome architectures and substrate for in, uh, in, uh, leading to the future, and also can improve the performance and energy efficiency of other uh, of processing using DRAM architectures in general. Uh, again, uh, thanks a lot for listening. And if you want to check your paper, you can scan the QR code uh, in this screen. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Juan. I don't know if there is more questions from the audience. 
Thank you, Geraldo. I don't see any uh, new questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, there might be some questions here in Zoom. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, I can I can ask you something. Um, so as far as I know, uh, Simdiran supports uh, uh, operations on integer values, right? So how about floating point values? Could that be something that could be implemented in Simdiram as well? And what, if if possible, what would be the performance that you would expect? Yeah. So we do discuss a little bit the the problem of implement implementation of floating point operations in Simdiram. And it is possible to implement float point operations uh, in Simdram with support of the memory controller. Um, however, when you implement Simdram, uh, uh, for example, uh, float point addition, we need to do Mantissa uh, normalization, right? And for you to do Mantissa normalization, you need to shift some uh, the Mantissa based on the exponent value. So you can compute the exponent uh, difference with, with using Simdram. Uh, subtraction operation, but then for you to, since there is no connection across uh, individual bit lines in Simduram, for you to do this bit shift, you need to copy the, of the, the, of the Mantissa, you need to copy the data, to, uh, load the data in the memory controller, do the, the bit shift, the, sh the, the shift in the normalization there, and then copy the data back, and then you can proceed to doing the computation in, in, in in Simduram. So I personally didn't evaluate how the throughput of, of uh, that particular implementation would be, but it's pretty likely that is, is not going to be so great. So we are constantly studying alternatives to try to, to, to solve this, this problem and don't, don't require this movement back of, of the exponents to the memory controller so we can avoid this traffic, right? Because it's the overall goal is to reduce mm -hmm. the traffic over there. Uh, about this, there, there is one uh, suggestion in the YouTube chat. Fixed point is easier uh, because you trade width for complexity. Yes. Yeah, big, big fixed point. We didn't evaluate any workload with fixed point in the result of the paper ourselves, but yeah, it's pretty, uh, fixed point should be a good solution uh, for sure. We also talk about alternative representations for fluid point operations, but uh, we don't have a complex solution uh, yet for it. I mean, fixed point, if I understand correctly, it should be as fast as integer operations, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty likely. Yeah. The, 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 only, the only problem is that you might be losing uh, the necessary precision accuracy yeah. for some workloads. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I have uh, another one is, um, so we have covered in the course, uh, as I said in the beginning, different processing near memory architectures. And this is uh, relatively simple and feasible as well, because we saw uh, in the, the previous lecture with PyVRAM that um, these kind of operations have been like, uh, bulk, bulk bitwise operations have been tested even on, on uh, off the shelf uh, chips. Um, so do you think that both trends can be combined into in, in future products, like, for example, in like uh, app mem architecture where uh, you have in the uh, DRAM subarrays? Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why not to, to do it, because like fundamentally, DRAM is not requiring anything more than what is already there, right? So just need DRAM uh, cells to operate as DRAM cells, and then we can uh, like pretty much this is a application process. So, and, and it is the Simduram, this process using memory uh, solution, it deals with a really particular type of subtract uh, of, of parallelism, sorry, uh, which is extremely book, parallel, uh, book parallelism, right? Over some uh, wide, large amount of data, uh, um, which can be one feature of a future uh, processing near, near uh, data solutions. And then when more complex, access patterns and finer grain access are required to do some particular computation, then you can use the processing near memory engine that you have in the system. But yeah, definitely both of, of, of them should, should and, and could be uh, uh, um, uh, be holistically integrated in a, in a single uh, in a single system for let's say ideal uh, 
uh, exploration of the processing memory capabilities of, of whatever system that's in the future release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That makes sense. I talked a few lectures ago about uh, one other uh, talk briefly mentioned briefly uh, another work of our group is uh, SISA uh, where um, that's uh, something that we actually tried in, in simulation very successfully for uh, graph mining workloads with different representations either uh, dense vectors or sparse arrays depending on the specific needs of the workload and the, 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 the code and the data set. Okay, thank you very much, Geraldo. Thanks, um, Thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, the, uh, just one last comment from in, in YouTube. Uh, it says 64-bit uh, fixed point is comparable to 32-bit floating point, which is uh, actually good news, I would say. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah. the, there there is a still the fact that uh, uh, operating in SIM DRAM because it's bit serial, uh, the, the higher precision requires uh, significantly higher latency, right? Um, even a quadratic latency for multiplication and, and other complex operations. But, but for sure, uh, it's uh, very interesting to keep these ideas in mind and to explore them in future work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, yeah, mm, I don't see any other questions and um, yeah, I guess uh, we are done for today. Thank you very much, uh, Geraldo, for the great lecture. Um, and I think we will have you again next Thursday for another interesting proposal. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. See you guys. See everyone next, next week. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and, and see you in the le next lecture. Bye-bye. All right.